It's fair to say that an actor knows he is having a great year when he acts opposite Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, and Yoda. That is the kind of year Samuel L. Jackson is having. He was nominated for Golden Globe for his role as Ordell Roby in Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown. Yo, yo, I need you to look up. You check out some music while you're sitting in the car. Take the key. Which one's for the car? Uh, this one right here. Use that little black thing there to turn off the alarm and unlock the door. What do I do? You ain't got to do nothing, man. Just point it at the car, push the button, you hear a little ooh, ooh, ooh. That'll mean the door's unlocked and the alarm's off. Get in. Jackson also had success with Eve's Bayou, which he starred in and produced. He's also been busy filming his roles in Barry Levinson's Fear and the Star Wars prequel. Joining me now, our friend Samuel L. Jackson. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Always good to be here. Uh, let me talk first about um, Jackie Brown. Okay. Uh, tell me about Ordell, because Quentin is here uh -huh. saying it's him that he should have <laughs> played the role. Well... I guess Quentin could have done it, um, but it's uh, essentially an Elmore Leonard creation. Um, I had to read two novels to find out who this guy was, uh, Switch and, um, gosh, what, what would, well, Jackie Brown, which yeah. wasn't Jackie Brown, which was Rum like Punch. Right, right. Uh, and uh, he's a guy who's been running scams all of his life that didn't work, and all of a sudden he's found something that works for him that's not as dangerous as drug dealing or anything else. He's a gun runner. And he's trying to make one million dollars so he can retire. That's all he needs to retire is one million dollars. And he's willing to do anything to get that million dollars and to eliminate anyone who gets in his way to do that. How does he compare among the bad dudes that you have played? Well, I've never played a character that had no redeeming social qualities whatsoever <laughs> until this guy. Uh, Ordell has no None. redeeming social qualities. He's charming, but he's so deadly and conniving, it's incredible. What was it you said in Pulp Fiction? A dog can be charming. What was that line? You uh, know? Uh, pig, pigs can be charming. You know, uh, dogs, dogs have personalities, but, but pigs don't. But it has to be one charming pig, like that, that pig Arnold on Green Acres. Got to have a whole lot of, whole lot of personality. Right. Right. How is Quentin uh, to work for? Well, Quentin's always a joy. He um, has a set that's that's full of life. His enthusiasm uh, is passed along to from the cast to the crew to the craft services people to the producers to the people that are just standing around watching. Yeah. Uh, everyone gets involved because he has such a great respect for the process, and he wants it to work. And he enjoys his his own writing. He laughs out loud in the middle of our takes. We have to tell him to shut up so we can finish our job. <laughs> He loves it, and he stands there and watches the actors work. He doesn't, he doesn't live in a monitor like a lot of directors. You attack a character by creating, what, a biography in mm -hmm. your head? Yes. What's that? Well, um, a lot of times you, um, I try and figure out where he was born, what his educational background is, what he's done in his life up to that point, uh, the kinds of foods that he likes, uh, why he has the relationships with certain kinds of people. In this instance, it was very easy because Elmore, had a roadmap for these guys. He, he, he tells you where they came from but in what Detroit. What does the biography tell you? Does it tell you wh how this person would react under certain circumstances? Of course. And of what course. It, uh, it, uh, it uh, gives you a certain intellectual level to uh, work from. It tells you whether he's had one or more parents and the, the, the kind of love that you can make up for that person that, are, that totally accounts for how he reacts to other people. Yeah. So you get to make up things that form a real person. Now, whether you get to use those things on screen, verbally or outwardly or not, it creates a whole person for yourself. So that when you show up, people know that you're coming from somewhere. And when you leave, people know that you're going somewhere. It gives Do you an agenda. You work with Travolta. You work with Bruce Willis. You've worked with De Niro. You work with Hoffman. Are all of them different in how they seem to approach acting? Oh, yeah, totally. Totally, very much so. Um, John and I had great conversations about everything in the uh, trailer or on set. And we would talk about our family, we would talk about our friends, but John was very meticulous about what he was going to do. He had to know specifically what everything was going to, to be and how it was going to happen. So we rehearsed very precisely and meticulously. Um, Dustin will come with a lot of stuff and he's constantly changing and evolving while the scene goes on and he's finding ways to make it work for him and every scene's a little bit different. Um, De Niro is very quiet and withdrawn 
so before a scene, he may not say a word or he may not say anything all day long until you're on set working. And you can ask him, say, you know, Bob, is there anything that you need? No, 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 no I'm fine. Because whatever you give him, he'll find a way to work with it. Uh, and it's interesting that way. Do any of them make you better? Uh, do they you, all make me better. They do? Yeah. Because um, these are... Well, they're legendary, and, and they're all very crafty. Yeah. And um, I consider myself crafty also, but they all have these great theater backgrounds, which is, you know, a totally wonderful thing to understand because they know how to develop their characters, and they know who they are when they show up, and they know why they're doing things. Um, the whole time I was doing Jackie Brown, it was, it, was, it was so interesting to me to watch Bob because a lot of times I didn't have a clue what he was doing because I was so busy being Ordell, and I would, I would see him kind of staring off, and I'd go, wow, he's not paying attention, or he's underplaying me in a certain kind of way. And then when I saw the film, I got so caught up in watching him rediscover the world and how it had changed since he'd been locked up for four years yeah. that it was so wonderful to watch. I've only seen the film once. So I have to go back and watch myself yeah. because I get caught up watching him. You know, it's amazing to me. I, I suspect, I know this is true because Scorsese was here last Friday night. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about when he sits around with directors that he likes and they watch film, they'll talk about little nuances about how Ford would do this, John mm -hmm. Ford would do this, or someone else would do that. You guys can see a lot of stuff yeah. that those of us who don't have that craft don't get. Don't get what's going on there. A lot of stuff actors are probably giving us, mm -hmm. we're missing, we're yeah. missing, just missing, yeah. you know, because we're caught up in just sort of scene to scene to scene to oh, scene. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the layman is watching the story unfold. Exactly. I'm sitting there watching actors do things that pertain specifically to a character, like watching um, As Good As It Gets, watching Jack Nicholson do those things, like stepping over those cracks, washing his hands, doing those things. How consistent can he be with that? Or my wife was watching 187, uh, and she was watching me be this very nerdy kind of precise kind of guy, and she was saying, how long can he sustain that? Yeah. And when we got home, she said, you know, I have to compliment you. You pulled it off. You did it the whole film. You didn't crack. Yeah. You know, and a lot of times we're just doing stuff like that. You know, oh, he changed his accent. Aha, uh -huh, he didn't yeah. sustain that accent. But that's just little actor stuff. What's the take you have on Quentin and his fascination with black culture? Well, I happen to know that Quentin's mom was on the road a lot when he was young. She was a salesperson. And he spent a lot of time with this black guy that lived in their building. Yeah. And this guy took him to black exploitation movies all the time. Right. That's where he hung out. <laughs> so that was his initiation into that world. And he fell in love with it. Like, kids are very easy to influence. Sure. And he fell in love with that world. He discovered it. He embraced it. He still does. Uh, and he kind of feels comfortable in that space because that's that's kind of where he grew up and 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 learned a lot about life yeah. and he likes the music though and oh, he, he totally. likes the sense oh of, the whole thing of, you know the whole street, you know the the wise, the, the street culture yeah, exactly. the the language the rhythms yeah, of that world exactly, yeah. all work for him and he writes in that vein he's why he could do uh, pulp fiction of so course well. of course i mean he's he's had the beach experience he's had the black experience and he's had you know all those other little yeah, things the thrown in. Experience. so now he's you know he's he's uh growing and i think this movie shows a great maturity on his part it's not getting as good a reviews as pulp fiction though yeah and i think it's totally unfair for people to even compare the two films and i i actually think a lot of the um backlash is because it's not pulp fiction right and it's slower. It's that's not his fault. It's right. an Elmore Leonard novel that he adapted for the screen. Uh, Pulp Fiction is an anomaly of sorts. Uh, I doubt if anybody will duplicate it or, or people will find a way to make a film that even resonates in the public's consciousness the way that that film does. Uh, Quentin did something that was totally unique even to himself. It was not only style but language. I mean, oh yeah, and, and it was everything. There's so dialogue, many elements I mean, there. It's in your face in so many different ways. Eve's Bayou. Uh, you're proud of that film. Oh yeah, terrifically <laughs> proud. Yes. Yes. It's a, the little film that could. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is what Roger Ebert said. This is the number one film of 1997 for him. Astonishingly sure debut film by writer-director Casey Lemons, Casey. Casey Lemons, who explores the secrets of a Louisiana family through the not always understanding eyes of a 10-year-old girl. She has a strong affection for her father, loyal doctor, a local doctor, and is jealous of what he seems to favor 
his her older sister. Samuel L. Jackson's also a womanizer, and when Eve sees him with a local woman, all sorts of half-understood emotions come churning into her heart. You're the producer? Yes. You are responsible for this being made in part? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, how did it happen? Um, I read the script a couple of years ago, and um, I liked it. But at that time, I guess I wasn't a big enough name to get it done, and the script was being shopped around, and Danny Glover got it, and he wanted to do it, but he also wanted to direct it. And Casey didn't want to give that away. She wanted to direct it, so she held on to it, and they kept shopping it. And it eventually came back around to me. And, and I was a big enough name. Yeah, I was a, I was a big enough name to get three million dollars to get it made. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we made it for. Three uh, million dollars. Three million dollars. Yeah, which is a shoestring Stunning. budget. Yeah. yeah. And we fought. We cried. We did all kinds of things to get this film done. It's, it's called the hot art house film of 1997, but it's yeah. a more than that. Yeah, it's it's a, a wonderful little story that, that crosses cultures in a whole lot of ways. I mean, a lot of people understand this film, uh, and they love it visually, they love the story, and the people in it are, are people that we all know from somewhere in our lives, uh, in our specific kinds of ways. But Casey did a wonderful job with this film, so did Amy. You know, we all uh, sacrificed a lot to get this film done, and I'm, I'm, I'm just terrifically proud of, of the fact that it got done and that people do appreciate it in that way. Take a look. This is a clip from Eve's Bayou. How come you never dance with me? Baby, how can you say your daddy never dances with you? When we're alone and stuff, but not at parties, you always dance with Sicily. Tell you what, from now on, we'll dance at every Kevin was here the other night. Yeah, Kevin's, we did a you, film called you, you finished called the Navigator or something. The Negotiator. The Negotiator. Yeah. Now, what's that? Um, I play a police hostage negotiator who's framed for a crime, and I end up taking the Internal Affairs Department hostage, and they call <laughs> Kevin in to talk me out of the building. So you have so two Kevin negotiators. So Kevin is talking to negotiate out of. Yeah. yeah. And, and I know all the tricks, so they can't just get in there and get me out. <laughs> Who wrote the script? I'm not sure. A couple right. of different people wrote it. You also have Sphere coming out. Yes. That's what Barry Levinson directed. Barry Levinson, Dustin Hoffman, Sharon Stone from the Michael Crichton novel. Sphere was the title of the novel? Yes. Uh, and it's about a, a spaceship that the Navy finds buried underwater, and when they get down there, they find out it's been there for 300 years. And they bring in a team of scientists to find out where it came from and what's on it. Is that finished? Yes. Okay. And you also did Star Wars, the prequel. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> you that and was Yoda. Great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's great about that. it? I just love that whole series of films. So for me to be able to go there and be a part of it was was really wonderful for me. And I have one other big, well, it's an independent art film, it's a big film called The Red Violin, which yeah. is oh, really I read about that a violin. A and what happened to it back story. from 1610 oh, yeah. forward? Beautiful story by uh, Francois Girard, the guy who did 32 films about Glenn Gould. Yeah. This is a small budget film too, or not? No, it's actually grand in its scale in that... Uh, Big bucks for Zen. No, no, no. Um, it, it's, a, it's an independent film that was done on a grand scale because it goes from 1610 to the present and it travels through about five different countries. He shot the film in each of those countries in the native language of yeah. those countries, uh, including China. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.